Yes, welcome to the second part of our discussions. And this is where we also bring the, the brilliant mind of Lisa Hugo on this discussion and, and ensuring that we understand. Bruce, before we even go any far, I, when I was reading that judgment, I saw something called non-variation clause. What is this animal in a simple layman terms? For someone like me, who's just a mere tax advisor, who doesn't understand the legal jargons uh, as much as you and Lisa. So do you wanna, do you wanna perhaps uh, uh, maybe before I bring Lisa into the party uh, and, and jump into that? Well, in a nutshell, a non-variation clause is you can't change this agreement unless certain formalities are complied with. So it's, I'll be perfectly honest, they are amazing clauses. They prevent the accidental amendment of the agreement or variation of the agreement. They ensure certainty and clarity. For think, about, think about this. Um, when you buy a house, mm. right, you make sure the entire agreement is in that written agreement. Mm. And in fact, most uh, agreements to buy a house would mm. have a non-variation clause. Mm. Now, think about this. If part of the negotiations, um, you, you said, you know, maybe I should have offered, given you a little bit more money. Mm. Mm. If it if it weren't for that clause, the seller could ask for more money and get more money and claim it from you. Mm, mm. So this clause brings certainty into the picture, brings clarity mm. and requires certain formalities to be complied with in order to change the agreement. Mm. Now with settlement agreements, sometimes you'd have to go to court for the court to approve the change. Mm. But again, that just adds to the barriers and protections put in place to protect the agreement because mm. those agreements are very sacred for lack of better expression. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's, that's, that's quite interesting. Lisa, let me bring you to the party. Um, I mean, you, you've read the court case. You, 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 I think for me is what stood out. I mean, earlier on part one, we saw a Bruce narrated on what stood out for him. And then, and, and in, in your understanding, what really stood out uh, from these background facts from this court case? The thing that stood out for me the most is where the lady initially claimed that she was not fully aware of the extent of the marital regime. She mm. knew she was married out of community of property, but she wasn't aware of the cruel aspect. Mm. Then she wanted to turn the 360 and be like, wait, what do you mean is it cruel? What do you mean I'm losing all of a sudden? <laughs> so... The fact that you can be married for so many years, mm. but not fully even understand what you agreed to in the beginning. First of all, who was with her when she was signing off on this? Like, how was she not aware of what she was getting into? And I think that that actually happens to more people than you actually think of. Is it? Even people who come into marriage and be like, I have no assets, you have no assets, let's just get married in the community, you'll probably will be fine. But then somehow the divorce turns ugly regardless. Mm -hmm. So people don't actually really sit and think about what they're doing before they get married and then also not looking at all your options. Because how can one partner be aware of the fact that they were married with a girl and she was not, or she not present at the time? <laughs> That's you know, what really shocked me. 100%. And to add to what you've said, Lisa, is as a notary, when you sign the antinatural contract, I literally read the contract to you and explain it. That's, so it, that, that's that's actually very interesting i think that was gonna be my my, my first um, my other question to say when she was right uh signing this uh and nuptial contract wasn't that actually read out for to her yeah she had no counsel at all the problem is that she has really no the facts do not give us any sort of refuge mm. Mm. Right? Mm. I said no, she would sit there and read the contract out to the people who are executing in front of you. Mm. Right? It's my job. And also my job is to explain it. That's why notarial deeds, notarial contracts have a special place in our law. Mm. For instance, um, a notarial contract, you've got a six-year period to enforce it, not a three-year period, which is the default. Mm. Mm. Right? Um, when you separate from somebody, you, you conclude a notarial uh, agreement of separation or notarial mm. deed of separation. Mm -hmm. right? The courts actually give it additional weight. Mm. 
mm. right? Mm. And because of the explaining component, the reading component. So the person can be completely blind and they can enter into this agreement badly. Okay. So, yeah, no, okay. Uh, uh, Lisa, you are still also uh, on, on the track of uh, sharing with us what stood out for you. I mean, you mentioned the issue of uh, marital regime that she she's claiming that she wasn't aware. What else you you may share with us that stood out for you? Um, another thing is, well, it's not relevant so much anymore in South African law, but just the fact that there was a point in time where as you as the cheating spouse <laughs> wanting the divorce and then wanting to turn around and be like, not only do I want this divorce to be clean cut, but I also want my share which is such a wild concept because once upon a time, you couldn't just be cheating. Like you would face actual consequences as the cheating spouse. And now you're the one that's making all of these demands and your husband's just sitting there like, no, but you also threatened me via email as well. So it's kind of like the way the law has evolved, but also sort of the entitlement that comes along with it. So she's ignorant and entitled. <laughs> But Lisa, maybe maybe let me let me let me actually I want that clarity because this it I don't know. Look, I'm not a divorce lawyer, obviously, but I feel that most divorces in the recent times has a lot to do with cheating. So now my question is: you are saying that a cheating is no longer a major factor when it comes to risk distribution and in also in terms of negotiating of the settlement agreement. Did I hear that correctly? Both of you, can you please enlighten me for someone like me who is not informed? Is Bruce going to take it over? Well, <laughs> uh, recently the Constitutional Court held that in our law, you no longer have a claim for interference in somebody else's marriage. You love who you love, you sleep with who you sleep, you can't be pen penalized for that. And, flow and with that in mind, the courts have turned their backs on punishing the adulterous spouse in her, in her marriage. Uh -huh. So for that being said, you could hypothetically include a clause in your antenuptial contract to introduce some sort of penalty or uh, consequence, but because of that recent constitutional court ju uh, judgment, it's questionable as to how enforceable it is. Yes, uh, I was gonna. My follow-up question was gonna be: How will that uh, clause actually be constitutional? Because it's not even sub. It's it's sort of uh, going against the constitutional court judgment. Well, recently there was also a case where they attacked a piece of legislation that and also um, attacked how it affects anti-nuptial contracts. Yes. And the courts were emphatic about the protection of the right to contract as you please. Mm. Mm. They said it's very important. So they did not intrude on that right. Rather, they intruded on the legislature's power to legislate. They said, what you put in place is unconstitutional, but the contract still good. So it's a little bit difficult as to predict how mm. the end result will look like, but mm. it will be definitely be interesting. Okay. Yeah. I think to be more safer and sound, don't cheat. I think, I think that's, I think that well, is. Don't get caught cheating. Oh, wow, Lisa, I didn't hear that. Okay. Lisa said it. I didn't hear that. Anyway, so, but I think for me, let maybe let's summarize the, the outcome and the lessons from the court case. Um, I, I, think, I think Bruce, from me, is, is, I mean, uh, having read the, the court case is consult, consult, yeah. consult, consult. Don't act out of emotions uh, when you are signing agreements, especially when, you, when it comes to marriage, marriage issues. Understand what you're putting your signature into. And any type of matri matrimonial property regime that you're gonna enter into, consult and have a clear understanding what it means. By the way, I saw a court case recently where they change is gonna potentially changes the landscape of how the whole 
marital regime is uh, the one where they're saying that I think it's section seven, subsection uh, three of divorce act that has been found to be unconstitutional. Do you want to briefly maybe as a nuggets, you know, like you don't have to go into them. Uh, detail uh, and summarize that that judgment in a, in like sixty seconds, Bruce. Okay. Well, in short, now anybody can ask for a redistribution order if they married our community property and without the accrual. So now, spouses are free to ask the court to uh, redistribute assets. For instance, husband's estate grows massively while the wife maintained the household contributed to his, and contributed to his success. The courts will say, well, she helped you. There ought to be a, some sort of redistribution. Mm-hmm. So the courts have now enabled that. Previously, the position was if, you're, if you were married before the new Marital Property Regime Act came into effect, you were entitled to this, but not after. But now there's no distinction anymore. Anybody can ask for it that's married out of community property without accrual. Mm, okay, that's that's quite interesting. So anyway, so Bruce, what stood out out of uh, this uh, the earlier discussion we had, and Lisa, what stood out out of um, the discussion we just had around the this incident of someone who has divorced and later on claimed that no, we're not quite aware. Uh, they feel that they should have, they could have, and but uh, there's a court order already for their settlement agreement. What stood out and what has been your license and what would you advise someone who's watching this? Well, what stood out for me and believe it or not, I actually advise clients quite often about this is do not make a rushed rushed decision. You'll regret it. Mm. Don't make rushed decisions. You'll regret Mm. it. Punchline. Lisa and you? To piggyback off of what Bruce said, it's basically like don't make rush decisions, rush decisions, which are basically always based on emotion. Mm. And love is a very strong emotion, but when money's involved, love dips first. <laughs> so <laughs> you're thinking about your wedding and you're happy and everyone's celebrating, but at the end of the day, this is still basically a business transaction. Mm. It's a contract, mm. it's a piece of paper. There are very real life implications. It's not just a fairy tale. So to be able to put those emotions aside. And if you can't consult, like you said, go to people who can, who don't have some sort of um, anything to gain from the situation. Yes. Because if you're sitting here, you're like, oh no, I love him. He's never going to leave me. And you end up in a position, now you end up with less. Yes. So to put those emotions aside, get someone who's level-headed, who can assist you, who can guide you, who will read the contract you're signing out to you and always just try to have separate counsel. Yes. Because at the end of the day, the one who's paying, who's actually paying out of pocket is going to be the one that actually benefits at the end of the day. Whereas they can still be looking after you, but they know where the money is coming from. They know where the little tips are coming from. Correct. Correct. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you. And for those who got told of this recording, we say thank you so much to have reached this position of watching this. And if you've got any further queries or a uh, questions or you need some sort of a tax planning and estate planning or some sort of you're about to get married you need your anti-nuptial contract or you're thinking of divorcing um you know who to speak to you can come to intergen and then we will assemble a team for you and assemble a team together with the uh, bsa law and then we put everyone together the heads together and say how do you preserve wealth in the midst of divorcing and i always say Divorce shouldn't be divisive, rather. We should also think that there's life beyond divorce, where we should think about the kids, we should think about our well-being, and we should also think about protecting the wealth rather than say, I want this, you take that, and then and then it becomes less valuable because of our emotions. So for me, Shile Mutiba, I thank you so much. If you need text matters, you know who to speak to. If you need legal matters, you know who to speak to. So from me, good evening, good night, good morning, good afternoon. It depends on what time you're watching us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all. It's always been a pleasure. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a lovely evening or like Shilly Boy said, afternoon, day, whatever time of day you might be watching this. <laughs>